Assalamu alaikum. It's Saturday morning, so get ready for your weekly dose of Annoor the Light. Eid is on our doorstep, so we've put together this collage to commemorate the very special day. The day of Eid al-Fitr is celebrated globally to commemorate the end of the fasting period. It usually starts with early morning as young and old ready themselves to attend mosque and perform the Eid Salah. Eid al-Fitr is marking the end of the month of Ramadan, beginning the month of Shawwal, and it is a day of celebrations. As Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa taslim has said, لِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ عِيدٍ وَخَدَ عِيدُنَا Every nation that are on this earth, they have a day of celebration or they have a festival. Eid al-Fitr is the festival of a Muslim. Eid al-Fitr morning is spent in prayer. This is a time for giving thanks for the blessings of Ramadan. Muslims have just spent the past 30 days abstaining from eating and drink as part of their religious duty to their Creator. We do have fun, we do have Mary, we do have all the goodies. But our celebration starts where we will glorify the Almighty Allah on this day. Normally on the day of Eid, after the morning Fajr prayer, what we would do is, when the sun rises, immediately, then we will read two rakats of Salah, which is called Eid Salah, and we will glorify Allah, and we will call out the Takbir, which is Allahu Akbar, we will call it out seven times or we will call it out 11 times or so. So our celebration starts with glorifying the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a day where families gather to wish each other well. Food and drink are in abundance as they celebrate the day. In some countries, the festivities carry on for three days, but in South Africa, most Muslims only observe one. Eid al-Fitr is significant to me as the end of the month of Ramadan and Eid al-Fitr is significant for a person who is going to perform Hajj because a person who wants to make Hajj on the 29th, 30th of Ramadan, if he had to dawn an ihram and say, I'm going to make Hajj with this ihram, will be void, it will be null. And the first of Shawwal, which is the day of Eid al-Fitr, marks the beginning of the days of Hajj. So you find that the day of Eid al-Fitr is a day of celebration, but yet another ibadah starts in the form of Hajj immediately. On this day, Muslims are forbidden from fasting as the day of Eid is specifically designated to celebrate. Many people will go out and buy new clothes to mark the day. Special dishes are cooked and served for the great feast at lunchtime. Ramadan reminded Muslims not to forget about those less fortunate and many organizations ensure a pot of food is distributed to the needy. On this day, you open your heart and you look towards those who are the underprivileged also, those who do not have, and you even go to this extent that you will give sadaqat al-fitr on this day. It has been said by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa taslim that when a person, a believer, a mu'min, when he fasts, his fast is between the earth and the skies and the heavens. By giving sadaqat al-fitr, it purifies the fast and that fast will reach the Almighty. The ultimate fasting is for the Almighty to cleanse it. That is why sadaqat al-fitr is given 
and at the same time benefiting the poor and the needy so they could also enjoy this day. The festival of Eid al-Fitr is a fitting tribute to the month of Ramadan. Together with the holy pilgrimage, it forms the biggest event for Muslims. They are encouraged to remember the lessons learned during Ramadan and implement these in their daily lives. Eid Mubarak. As we watch the month of Ramadan very quickly slip away, I pray that we have earned God's favor for adhering to our duty of fasting. Molana Ibrahim Baam is standing by with this week's Q&A. Alhamdulillah wa ahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da amma ba'da. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Respected viewers, we begin by praising Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the many favors Allah has bestowed upon us. And we send salutations upon the messengers of the Almighty and all of those who follow them in righteousness and may Allah make us amongst them. Welcome back again to the Q&A segment of the Annur program. Today we have a very interesting question to begin our program. Someone said, I want to visit Paris. However, fasting begins in the very same time as my break. I doubt I can take the long hours of fasting because in the Northern Hemisphere at this time of the year, the fasting is very long. Should I simply not go to Paris and fulfill my fasting duties in my country? Bear in mind, we all know that firstly, when you are going and you are a traveler, then of course, fasting is not compulsory upon you. It is better to fast. However, bear in mind, what type of travels are we undertaking? Is it a travel that is necessary? It is part of your obligation, part of your responsibility, part of your business that you have to go. If you have to go, then obviously it is better to fast. However, if you cannot manage the fast, you can, you can, because you are traveling, there is laxity and accommodation for you to fast those fasts afterwards as Kaza. However, bear in mind, what is the purpose of your travel? If it is not compulsory, if it's not, not, not necessary, and you can delay it, and if it can be delayed, then definitely it would be better, because you don't want to go into another country when is fasting month and during the course of the fasting month you feel guilty that you are touring and you might be able to be in a situation where in our holiday mode we might not be able to show sufficient respect for Ramadan. So while it's permissible for you to go and while it will be permissible for you to keep the fast later on, my suggestion in this particular regard would be if you can delay it for a later time it would be perhaps better for you so that you could keep and fulfill your fasting duties at home and also maintain the sanctity of the Mubarak and blessed month of Ramadan. I often get angry during Ramadan because I tend to be hungry. How can I be better? Bear in mind one simple solution. Who are we fasting for? It is not fair if you are fasting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you take out your anger on other people. You are fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, it comes in a hadith that Nabi Karim sallallahu had said, even if someone tends to argue with you in the month of Ramadan, then excuse yourself by saying, Inim ru'un sa'imun. I am fasting. I don't want to get involved in an argument and dispute with you. So the best way is, even if you tend to get angry, then keep yourself aloof from situations that can exacerbate your anger. You know, and bear in mind you are doing it for the sake of Allah. And when you are doing it for the sake of Allah, it's not fair to vent your anger on someone uh, when they are not at fault, when you are doing something for the sake of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pay money to the mosque for its maintenance and to help pay off its debt. So does that money count as paying zakat? Allah Ta'ala in the Holy Quran had said, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ Allah Ta'ala has determined eight categories of zakat. And Allah Ta'ala starts it with the word lam. And the word lam in the Arabic language means lam for tamlik. Lam to make someone the owner. So in our zakat, we give someone who becomes the owner of that wealth. And to give for masajid is something where the masjid does not become the owner of that wealth. So we have to give zakat to people who are poor, people who are needy, people who are deserving. 
And there are other considerations upon our wealth other than zakat. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Inna fil mali haqqan siwa zakat. There are other considerations upon your wealth other than zakat. So the aspects of giving to masajid or giving to religious organization, that cannot be paid from zakat. It should be paid from lillah. And these are part of the considerations that are upon our wealth. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a blessed Ramadan. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Our social media is one way of staying in touch with viewers and we encourage interaction on these platforms as well as on our YouTube channel. Please join or tell your friends to like, follow and share our details. Entrepreneurs are often born out of a need to solve their own problems, as is the case with our next story. Other than turning to the Qur'an and Sunnah for one's spiritual needs, for centuries Islam has also provided the answers to medical and health matters. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Allah did not create a disease for which he did not create a cure. It is therefore not surprising that herbal and plant-based remedies are becoming a preferred choice in many households. Prophetic medicine refers to all the recommendations, uh, prohibitions, advices that was given by the Prophet in, of Islam with regards to health promotion. The Prophet advised that we look after nature, that we uh, nature was given to us as a source of healing, a source of nourishment. So herbs has a big role to play. Uh, we find that in, in the prophetic traditions, he often advised um, his companions to use different herbs for various illness conditions. And if you look within Islamic medicine, we find that it all stems from the Prophet's time. We gave great consideration to the importance of herbs. Rehana Hussain holds a degree in biotechnology with a research focus on natural products and antibiotics from the South African environment. She has in turn used this research to create herbal products specifically geared at mothers and babies. It all started because my niece was born prematurely at 28 weeks. Her gut wasn't developed properly and then she in turn had problems sleeping as well as with colic. Her parents tried many different remedies but they, it basically didn't work. I decided to just do some research and see if there was something that I could perhaps make her that could help. And then I came across the benefits of essential oils and carrier oils and how to incorporate them topically so that I could create something for her. And then the first product I created for them was Sleepy Times, which was just to help her sleep and relax and calm down in the evenings. And then it worked very well for her. So then that's how Radiant was born. Honey, black seed oil and olive oil are just a few on the long list of remedies encouraged by prophetic medicine. Tibanabui Prophetic Medicine speaks about aromatic herbs, so the use of basil, frankincense, camphor. And today it's scientifically proven that camphor is a natural antidepressant. So today we find that the herbs that were given in the past actually had great medicinal value that acts on various levels, not just a physical level, it has emotional importance because it, it triggers the emotional parts of the brain, the feel-good hormones, to bring about calmness during times of distress. So therefore we find the, the field of aromatherapy is so huge today and it all stems back from previous years. So Sleepy Time contains lavender essential oil, rose essential oil, and chamomile essential oil. So, all, so those three essential oils are all known for the relaxing and sedative properties. So it gently aids the body into relaxing and calming down and basically just become more open to the idea of sleep and it encourages sleep. Rehana uses the properties of essential oils and plants in order to create creams, ointments, remedies, face and body products using local herbs and plants. I started using um, natural products uh, a few years ago already, but I was still mixing it with other products. Once I fell pregnant with my daughter Jinan, I became really serious about using natural products. I was uh, worried about my physical well-being and uh, more so my baby's physical well-being as well. Because I'm breastfeeding as well, so possibly like if I use like an unnatural underarm, it would probably enter my body and go into, into my milk. I was really worried about that as well. So I try to stick to natural products as much as I can. A lot of people have told me my skin has gotten better. I used to get breakouts on my forehead. I don't get that anymore and along, the, along this area. I don't get that anymore, alhamdulillah. During um, 
the, the Prophet's time, he would recommend that people seek treatment from trained physicians. So there were people that understood the different herbs, the qualities of the herbs, temperaments, adverse effects. And we find today most people, there's a misconception, they believe that herbs are natural, therefore it's all safe. That's not true. Every herb, because it's a medicine, it can also be a poison to some, some level. So in our profession, we, we're very strict when it comes to prescription of herbs in that you should be seen by a practitioner in order to be given herbal medication. So Islamically, natural medicine has been encouraged. There's a lot of herbs and oils that's mentioned in the Quran. For instance, olive oil is mentioned quite a few times in the Quran and the properties and benefits of olive oil to drink as well as to anoint yourself with. And then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said black seed is a cure for all ailments except death. Olive oil is also one of the big um, carrier oils that we do use in our products. Um, partially because of the Islamic background and we also know that olive oil is amazing for the skin. So the skin basically just loves olive oil and it just slurps it up and it makes you f your skin feel very uh, soft and luxurious as well. So that's also one of the reasons why we use it. A holistic approach to healthcare and medicine certainly isn't new. A revival of natural science is underway in the Western world, but it's in the Quran and Sunnah that one can find a multitude of wisdom on a natural way of life. Kuzulu Natal is a favourite South African holiday destination and the region has adequate facilities for Muslims. We explore more of this beautiful province in this week's travel segment. Anyone who has been to Durban will know how hot it gets and one of the best ways to cool down, other than dipping into the sea, is at the Durban Ice Skating Centre. The Durban Ice Arena has been specifically designed as a multi-purpose venue so as you can see, it's not just an ice skating rink. We have so much more to offer. It's a great tourist destination and we like to promote Durban as a destination and grow it as well. So we do have public sessions and it's split between the school term, school holiday. School holidays, we open seven days a week and school term um, during the week we open to corporate schools, group bookings and on the weekends to the public. Ice skating comes with many benefits but most of all it's great fun. The ring caters for both beginner and more established caters. Equipment can be hired on site. It's the best experience you're ever going to have. It's outside your daily activities, what you'd usually do and we guarantee you the most fun experience um, you won't get anywhere else. Admission for spectators starts from 50 Rand and for skating it's around 90 Rand per person. It's fun because you've got the skating aids as well, we've got Penny the Penguin, Bobby the Seal, so if you're a beginner, um, you, and you don't know how to skate, the skating is help you find your balance on the ice. For the Muslim clients, we do have food that is all halal and we certified by the Islamic Council of South Africa. And that can be from the ice cafe. We also do other customized options for bigger events. Apart from ice skating, there are also other attractions for visitors. Food is quite basic, but they cater to the halal market, so there's no need to go outside. This is most definitely one of the more iconic places to visit when in Durban. What better way to laze away than under the trees at one of Durban's best kept secrets? The Freedom Cafe opened up in 2010 during the World Cup. It was owned by Neil Rokes and he was a celebrity chef and he just wanted to create a very unusual space for our international guests. Seven years later, I had uh, come through to pop by for a coffee and completely fell in love with the place, only to find out that it was on sale in the marketplace. And so we decided to take it over. So basically this is an indoor-outdoor setting. As you can see behind me, we are, it's set in a container, a shipping container, two actually. And um, this is our big olive um, fig tree rather that's become quite popular and home to Freedom Cafe. Many of our customers choose to come here 
um, just to chill and relax and indulge in a in a lovely healthy breakfast. We also have some spicy options for those that are not into help. Um, and then we've got an exciting lunch menu. So everything happens here from, let's say, 6.30 in the morning until half past 3, 4 p.m. In the, in the afternoons. Under the new ownership, the cafe has had a complete overhaul of the menu, retaining some of the best sellers and introducing bistro-styled halal food options. So what you were served this morning is the lamb benedict. So that's served with spinach and your hollandaise sauce. And it's served on a special rye bread that we have. And then you had the foot for a king. So that's quite popular. That includes your eggs, your steak. And then we served you the steak sandwich. So that's very nice as well. Quite spicy, if you ask me. And that's served with chips. People should come here if they're looking for something different in Durban almost an escapism from the busyness of their lifestyles and lives and businesses and work. Also for social gatherings, if ladies or mums want to take a break during the day or in between school runs, they can grab breakfast as early as 7 a.m. And um, the other is just basically to have a really nice meal in an outdoor or actually indoor environment. But with the container, it's glass all around. So you are getting the feel and um, experience of the natural setting as well. Seeing is believing and tasting is even better, as the cafe shows us. The place is fast becoming one of Durban's most popular hangouts and the best advice would be to book ahead. The Natural Science Museum has carved a name for itself with the informative and interesting displays it has on offer. It can be found right in the middle of the city and is bound to keep visitors busy for hours. We are here at the Bed Galleries. So here, these are the collections that are collected by us, our scientists that are based at the research center. It's also um, one great part of uh, the Natural Science Museum. That's where they do the research and then the, re the researchers work together with the exhibitions team. They actually do the research and then the exhibitions cascade the information through the exhibits and then the education team. Uh, just interpret all the exhibitions around the museum. There are countless displays dedicated to the fauna and flora of especially KwaZulu-Natal, with descriptions about their habitat and predatory habits. In birds exhibition, there's different kind of birds. There's water birds, there's birds that are found in terrestrial environment, so you get to know their habitats, their dietary requirements, how they adapt in different places. Opening times, it's half past eight in the morning, and then we close at uh, 6 p.m. every day, even on holidays and weekends, we are always open. And everybody is welcome, from little children and to the, to the elders, we welcome everyone. We even have facilities that allow disabled people to come through because our, we are on the first level floor, so we have a lift that that's where we accommodate everybody. The centre is a treasure trove of information for those who enjoy these kinds of things. As we witness the end of another Ramadan, do not forget to give thanks for being able to have participated. The best way to do this is to live every day from year on with the lessons learned during this auspicious month. From the team, we wish you an Eid Mubarak. Shukran for tuning in and Assalamu Alaikum from me, Zahra Robinson. <laughs>